Good morning. The reason I wanted to talk about how to format letters is that you will have an assignment, at least one, during English 3, in which you will be asked to write a professional business letter about a professional subject. And I don't think that's a skill that a lot of people learn as they're coming up through school. So I wanted to go through how to put such a thing together and also give you some background about it so that you can get maximum points when you have to do one in here. It's kind of unfair to ask you to do something that you haven't been taught how to do. So I wanted to make sure that everybody had some good preparation about this. So here's the thing, who really writes letters anymore? I mean, we text, we email, we FaceTime, we do all these other things. Who actually sits down and writes a letter? Uh, maybe over the holidays, uh, somebody makes you sit down and do a handwritten thank you note for a gift, but very seldom do people actually really write letters anymore. It's one of the reasons why the US Post Office continues to lose money because people are sending um, emails rather than regular letters. And in fact, one of the things the post office really wants to have happen is that people buy stamps and never use them, which is why they make stamps that have collectible pictures on them, whether it's Batman or Hot Wheels or baseball or famous actors or whatever. They want you to buy the stamps, give the post office the money, but never use the stamps to mail a letter because that service actually requires a person and a truck and somebody driving around to your house. But there are still situations in which we must write business letters. Even if we're not going to put it in an envelope, we still have to know how to perform that kind of correspondence because a letter is different than writing a poem or writing a song or writing a short story. So there is an expectation of doing it correctly. Someday you're going to want to write a letter to get a job interview or to apply for a mortgage or as an application to get an apartment lease or many other things. So we're going to talk about how to set the thing up and what all the parts are called, because it is different. There is particular terminology to it. But once you see it, I think it will make sense and it'll be a lot easier for you to do the assignment when you get to that. In fact, when we talk about email, that just means electronic mail. So even when you send an email to me about something, you're still writing a letter. So the expectations from the school district or myself or the people that I have to write to, associations I belong to, they think that you're doing letter writing even if you are sending it electronically. So there's an expectation about what looks right and what doesn't. And I wanna show you how to do that. We really have two parts that we need to consider. One is, what does it physically look like? How is it laid out? Where do you put all the different pieces and parts? Then we have to talk about what are you actually going to say? What are the words that you're going to use? What is your purpose? So we'll take a look at both of these things. First, let me talk about the layout. Now you're probably familiar, you've probably seen letters before, but I want to go over the different parts and I want to go about what they're called and why we do them in certain ways. The first thing I want you to notice is that everything is lined up on the left hand side of the margin. There are more old fashioned, more classic kind of letter formats that have some pieces on the upper right and some on the left. And those are nice and those are traditional and those are formal. But in the most part today, we line everything up on the left margin. And we call that either block left or flush left. And you'll see in your word processing program in Microsoft Word, or you'll see that 
in Outlook when you compose an email that everything automatically lines up to the left. So that's our preferred way of doing things anyhow. And most of our systems are already set up that that is the default setting. But if your thing starts to look a little bit off, one of the easiest ways to clean it up and make it look neat and professional is to line everything up down the left hand side. We need to include our return address. Who are we and where are we from? Because if we want this person to solve some problem for us or to do something for us, don't we need to tell them how to write back to us? So someplace in your letter format, you've got to include your return address. Who are you and where are you at? And typically we put that first. I'll show you an exception of that in a few minutes. We always put down the date for the letter. When you receive business letters, they will often make some reference to you having to do something like pay a bill within 30 days of the date of this letter. Notice it's the date of the letter, not the day that you get it. So really they don't care that it took the post office three days to get it here from Atlanta. It matters as to when the date was that the letter went out. So they will put a date on which gives them sort of a legal starting point and you have to put a date on yours to give you a legal answering point. That as of this day, I asked you to do some certain thing. It's hard for you to get after people for being slow if you didn't ever put a date on your letter to start with. So we have no idea how to run a calendar, how to calculate how long it took. So we have to have a date on here in some fashion. The next thing is we'll put in the receiver's address. Even though it's going to be outside on the envelope, we want to put it on the letter itself as well. And there's an old fashioned reason for this. It didn't used to be that envelopes had glue on them. Packages were just tied up with string. We didn't have all the strong packaging tape that we have now. So one of the things that we would be concerned about was what if the letter fell out of the envelope or what if the letter fell out of the package? How would this information ever get to the right place? So this idea of putting the person's proper correct address in the letter does matter. Are you writing to somebody in their work capacity or in their personal capacity? Meaning, is this a personal situation or is it a business situation? Because you could write to me at my house or you could write to me in care of Volusia Online Learning. Or you could write to me in care of the Volusia County School System. That's three different mailing addresses. So depending upon what the context is, that's where you want to send your letter and that's what you would put in this location in your letter format. Oftentimes, not always, we put in a subject line, kind of like the subject line in an email format. We put a subject line on a letter so that you're sending it to the boss, but one of his employees is going to take care of it. But the subject line lets whoever is going to solve the problem know what it's about. So this might be um, your car loan account number, or it might be that you have a concern about um, a pothole in your street and you want the city to fix it. Whatever the issue is, if you can put it in a few words at the start of the letter, it lets people know what it's about so they can help you more quickly. I mean, you want your problem solved, don't you? Why would you hide what it's about from the very person who can solve your problem? Instead, let's show them very quickly what's going on so they can get to it and work with you. So subject lines are very handy and we often do them 
in business letters, we almost never do them in personal letters. When you actually name the person that you're writing to, we call that a salutation. And notice I say in here that we use a courtesy title because by calling somebody Mr. or Mrs. or Ms., that's a courtesy title. In good manners, we assume that we are on a first name relationship only with people with whom we're close, family and actual friends. Otherwise, if you meet somebody, you'll call them by their last name and use one of these courtesy titles. So if I got really fortunate and got to meet, um, let's say, um, Nick Saban, the coach at uh, Alabama football, I would say to him, good morning, Coach Saban. I would call him by his title. And I wouldn't say, hello, Nick, because I don't know him that well. Never been to his house, okay? So if we have a personal relationship, first names are good. But the assignment you're going to have in this class, and when you're writing to strangers in a professional situation, you'll call them by their last name, and you'll use an appropriate title. Now, notice I said Coach Saban. I think that when somebody earns a title of accomplishment or respect, so if it's reverend or general or coach or sergeant, then that's what you would call them because you're indicating respect for what they have achieved. And that's always a good way to put them in a nice mood to assist you with your problem or be interested in what you have to say to them. So. It's courteous to just say Mr. or Mrs. or Ms., but it's extra courteous to use a professional title when you're dealing with people who have achieved some sort of accomplishment or rank. Then we get into the actual body of the letter, and I'll come back to that in the second half, because this is what you actually have to say about your problem, what you're trying to get done. If you were just talking to me in person and you had reached the end of what you were going to say, would you just turn around and walk off? Probably not. You would probably say something like, OK, well, that's it, or I'll see you later, or bye bye. You'd say something just as a way to indicate that your message was over and that you were moving on to your next thing. We do the same thing in a letter. So when we close with a phrase like sincerely yours, or if you knew somebody closely, you would say your friend, or if it was somebody you had a little romance with, you might say fondly. So we put a little word or phrase here to just indicate I finished up everything that I'm going to say and I am noting what kind of relationship we have when I do that. So even the most basic thing, saying sincerely yours, you're doing the courtesy of saying, none of what I just told you was a lie. Because being sincere means I was telling you the truth. So that's the minimum nice thing you could say on your way getting out of a letter. Lastly is your signature. Now, if you're sending this letter electronically, then you're not going to get a pen out and do a handwritten signature. It is possible in programs like Microsoft Word where you can switch to a drawing tool and you could sign it with the tip of your finger. Kind of like you may have done some places where you use a a debit or credit card and you see somebody sign on a pad with their fingertip. That generally is a very bad looking autograph. 
I used to actually have to have in my office because I was signing some of my certificates. They had a rubber stamp made with my real autograph on it so that myself or my secretary could stamp my letters and certificates. When I worked for the treasurer of the state of Florida because he signed all of the paychecks for all the government workers, they actually had to have a machine that was certified to make his signature. So it was a legally certified device that could replicate his true signature on all of our paychecks. But in some way, you've got to put your name on your letter. And we say that is the signature. Now, in this case, the person just used a fancy font to make it look like handwriting. And certainly you can do that. Your email program Outlook, because it uses all the Microsoft materials, has handwriting fonts that you could use to make it look like a handwritten signature. And that's nice. Sometimes there are legal documents that you can do where you send them back and forth electronically and they accept your electronic signature after verifying your identity. But in some way, a letter has to be signed. Also in the signature block, and you may have seen this on emails that you get from me, a person will put their full name and title. That's a proper thing to do on an official piece of business correspondence. And when you think about it, my business is to be your teacher. When I write to you, I am writing on behalf of the school and the county. So when I'm saying things like, next Thursday is Veterans Day and the school system will be closed. That's a piece of official government business, even though it's just between you and me. So I need to make it in a formal way because it's official business. So does anyone have any question about these basic parts? They all have their different names and you do all these different things because that's what makes it a proper business letter rather than just a note. All right, I don't see any hands. I don't hear any questions. Let me move on to a couple more points. If a person has printed stationery, actual paper that's created for their business purposes, as we do at Volusia Online, if we do it electronically, it automatically puts the date in the right place on the letter and then at the bottom, it creates my official title, my email address, mailing address, and all those kinds of things. Technically, we call this letterhead. In some formats, all that return address stuff would be at the top of the page. So that was the old fashioned way of doing it. So the letter would have a heading. And because of that, they called papers that were made that way printed letterhead. Just something for you to know, but in your email program, you can create letterhead. So you can create a stationary for the way that you send out your emails. So you can give it backgrounds and colors and whatever font that you like to make it look nice, and all those kinds of things. You can actually do electronic printing so that if somebody wanted to print your email at the other end, it would come out on a nice piece of paper with a nice design. So we can still do those kinds of traditional things. If you think about the way that your email form is built, it does all the same things that a professional letter would do. It has a place for you to put a subject line. It has a place for you to put the actual message. You can put in your salutation and your closing and your signature block. So, even when you're just sending emails, you are still doing letter writing. All of that same formatting takes place. And even if you look at this fake one, it's set up all flush left, which is just automatic. That's the way that things tend to be done anyway, because that is the accepted practice. So if you just go with how your email program sets things up, it will look correct anyway. And that will also help you <clears throat> set your assignment up correctly 
when you have to do that here in the English course. Now, let me give you a couple of points about the body of your letter. In a previous lecture, and the copy of this is in Canvas, and I sent everybody a link to the email where the video was located. You can write it in direct order if you feel the reader of your letter already agrees with you or already likes you or already wants to do something that you would ask them to do, which means you can start with what you're asking right at the beginning, and then you just back it up with some support and fade out at the end. And we call that direct order. But if you don't know them, if you don't know if they want to help you, if you're trying to convince them to do something for you, then you use what we call indirect order. So you preview what your topic is about and your subject line will help with a little bit of that. You support your idea with some evidence. You put in some stronger evidence. Then you throw down your biggest, most powerful piece of evidence. And then you reach your conclusion which is in business terms, we call this the ask or trying to close the sale. This is where you want the city to come fill in the pothole in your street or do something about the noisy dogs or give you a job interview so that uh, they might hire you. So you're trying to get them to do something and you're not sure that they will or you got to talk them into it. Then you've got to get stronger and stronger and stronger and save what you're asking for for the end of the letter after you have built up to it. So you see you got two different strategies depending upon whether or not you feel like they're with you and they know you and they're on your side or you don't know them or they might be against you or you got to talk them into it. So if you are in a strong position, you can go direct. If you feel like you're in a weak or an unsure position, you go indirect. Now, these two videos that we've already done, they're available for you in Canvas and I've also emailed the links to the videos to everyone back when we did them. But the five paragraph basic scholastic essay, that's really what you're doing in writing a business letter. You're still doing the same little outline and, and trying to uh, build to a convincing point. So those ideas will still help you when you get to the assignment of doing a professional letter. Also the one that we did about openings and closings. That's the one that features this idea of direct order <clears throat> and indirect order. So those two videos are available for you over on our Canvas website under the modules. You can find them and they have the link right to them. If you didn't happen to save the emails where I sent you the, the videos the week when we did them. <clears throat> So, we've talked about how a letter is formatted and how you put your content into the body of the letter. Those are things that you're going to need to do when you hit the assignment, the writing assignment here in English 3, where it asks you to write a professional letter. Now, let me close with a couple of important tips. First, Ingenuity is automatically going to score the letter. So before I get to put a score on it, it's automatically going to go through and look for things like misspellings and incomplete sentences and mispunctuation and things like that, just like it would on anything else. I know we get into a bad habit when we're writing emails back and forth that we write them almost as if we're texting on our phones. So a couple of phrases, we don't worry about capitalization. 
Uh, we might use abbreviations because after this long, we kind of have a relationship as teacher and student, and we can just ask each other stuff back and forth and be less formal. Don't do that for this particular writing assignment within the course. You have to treat it as an official real essay just written in letter form. So you've still got to have proper paragraph structure, complete sentences, punctuation, capitalization, spelling counts, all of those technical things still apply. Now, when you think about it, if I was sending a letter to some company that I wanted to give me a job, or I was sending a letter to the city because I wanted my street fixed, how likely would it be that they did what I want if my letter was full of misspellings and incomplete sentences and that kind of thing? They would probably just throw it away and not do anything for me at all. So treat this as an official business situation with all the formality and technical competence that you would do on any other essay. Second big tip. It's going to give you within the prompt for the assignment a situation. Write the essay, I'm sorry, write the letter according to that situation. Meaning you might have to look up who should be the proper person to receive this letter. If I have a pothole in my street or we have a, a busted street light and I need that fixed, am I going to write to the president of the United States or am I going to the right uh, write to my local city uh, road department? So I might have to look up in my town what department is in charge of streets. Or at the very least, I could write to the city commissioner for the district of the city where my house is located. Because if I live in Port Orange, why would I write to the commissioner who is in charge of Ormond Beach or Deltona? That would be dumb because he's got nothing to do with my streets. So that would delay me getting my problem solved. So for your assignment, when you get to this professional letter writing thing, you're going to need to look up a true actual person in a real business or government place who would be the right thing to deal with your problem. And then you write about your particular situation. So this is a reality exercise. You got to make it look as real as possible. You might need to look up a couple of things. For example, if I was doing this assignment as a student and it was asking me to deal with uh, the lack of a traffic light on my street, I might want to look up how far it is to the next traffic light in my town or how many traffic accidents have happened at that intersection in my town. I might want some real information to tell them we really need a traffic light here at this intersection. So everything that you need is not going to be sitting there in ingenuity waiting for you. You're going to need to look up a proper person, a proper company or agency to deal with, and you're going to have to look up a couple of pieces of supporting information to back up why you want them to do this thing. So you can't just make it up. You can't just um, write something generic because you're going to have to pick your own local situation and your own correct person that you would need to write to. Any questions about that context that you can anticipate for that assignment? I wanted you to know that in advance because I would hate for you to open up the prompt and then go, wait, I'm not ready to write this because I didn't realize I would have to, to think of anything. Okay, we got a question. 
Uh, let me unmute you or unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello. So when we're writing that later in Edgenuity, because that's actually what I'm doing today, what I really put, I'll, be, like, I'll put Dear Secretary of State and then I'll put my address right underneath that. Right, but you got to look up who is the Secretary of State and where is that office located? Okay. I mean, that that's easy Google stuff, but to make it a proper letter to an official, then you would want to have their correct title, which you have found, but you'd also want to find their um, actual office location. Because you, you can't just say Secretary of State and then put a stamp on it and put it in the mailbox because who knows where it would go. And it's just proper courtesy when writing to people in business and government that you would look up who they were and where they're located and all of that. I, I'll tell you an uh, actual thing that happened to me. When I worked in the state government in Tallahassee, there was actually – another Ronald Thomas who worked for a different department because I don't have a very unusual name. And I would sometimes get his mail and he would sometimes get mine, which was okay because we could have it sent back over, but it, but it meant that it might be a week before he actually got what he was supposed to have and before I got my mail. So... <coughs> Having the proper business address, uh, office number, street address, all of those things is very important. If you think about it, the state capitol in Tallahassee is a 22-story building. So just knowing what floor somebody is on is a help because they've got a lot of people delivering mail in that building. And there will be a basket for each floor of the building. <coughs> so as many details as you can get correct, the better off you are in being successful with your letter. Any other questions? All right. Thanks for thanks for checking in. <coughs> Is anybody else? Or does anybody have any issue going on with anything in general with the course? I did mention um, just in passing. <coughs> excuse me, having a sore throat today. That next week, next Thursday is Veterans Day. And that's a school holiday. So be aware of that. <clears throat> but you should also be aware. That that's when the school system is going to do a big computer maintenance project. So even though it's going to be a holiday. We can expect that email and course websites and all those kinds of things are going to be down all day. And oftentimes that stuff gets done in the middle of the night. When I get more information about it, I will send all of you an email and a reminder about it. But at least figure that next Thursday, you're not going to be able to get into the courses and do your work. If everything goes like it ought to, then all the courses and everything ought to be back up on Friday the 12th. If it was me, I would be working ahead a little bit just in case things don't come out perfectly after the 11th and systems are still a little messed up. So I would be trying to get a little bit ahead of things now while everything is running well before they try and do any maintenance or upgrades on it. Just because we all know mechanical stuff can be unreliable. That's just... That's the way I'm going to handle it anyway. I'm going to try and be ahead of my work too. All right. Any other questions? Anybody else want to talk about anything while we're here today? 
All right, very good. I'm going to shut this down. I'll get the recording edited, and then I'll put the link to this over in Canvas with those others like I referred to today. Hope this helps you out. Hope you do really well on that letter writing assignment when it comes up. I'll talk to you all next week, if not before.